has started us on a series um, going through the book of Nehemiah. And I'm not going to preach on the book of Nehemiah, but I am going to open with a little bit. So this is an, a view of the different gates. So Paul is, um, Pastor Paul talked to us through um, chapter 1 and chapter 2, and he'll be bringing us into chapter 3, which is the building of the gates. And um, the really cool thing about the building of the gates are the people who are involved. Um, in the building of them, but I'm going to give us a quick little overview of uh, the function of each of these gates, and then what we're going to do today is we're going to focus in on a story that took place at one of these gates. Um, so if we start up, and I don't know if you can totally see this, but on the top towards the right is the sheep gate. And so Nehemiah starts us out in chapter 3 talking about the sheep gate and telling us that the priests showed up and really um, took on that gate and oversaw the building of that gate. Um, coming around the corner, moving to the right, we see the inspection gate. Um, the inspection gate uh, is the gate where when um, Jeremiah was imprisoned. That's where he was held. Um, also, it's possible um, for the inspection gate, um, when the city was closed for the night, the, they would only open one gate for people to come in and out, and it was most likely over at the inspection gate. And there's many talk of um, when Jesus preaches to the rich young ruler about the camel passing through the eye of a needle. Um, that, that's the concept of this gate that's so small that a, in order for a camel to pass through, it would have to stoop down on its knees to try and like muster through the gate. And so that was the kind of gate that would be open at night. Um, and it's this beautiful image of us having to come to Christ on our knees, coming to God on our knees to get through in, in a humbled state. And um, so with all the research I was doing, I couldn't find anything that um, indicated that that was definitely built into the inspection gate. Um, some people don't think that gate actually existed over there. But if that is true, then the story, the account of the Jesus and the rich young ruler would have taken place over by that gate. Um, the east gate, uh, you're all very familiar with, I'm sure. The east gate, um, in Ezekiel 44, verses 1 through 2, he has this amazing vision, and God tells him that that gate, he, God, will pass through that gate. Um, and so Ezekiel writes this down, and um, by the time Jesus comes on the scene for us, that gate has been renamed the Golden Gate, and it's known as the King's Gate. Just outside the East Gate is the Mount of Olives, um, and it is the gate that Jesus comes through on Palm Sunday. So that huge celebration takes place right there at the East Gate. And Jesus, you know, he goes through and he goes straight to the temple. And then he starts flipping tables over and having a good time there. Um, the Horse Gate, um, obviously, is where the horses come through. And there's stables there. It's also the area where they built the quarters for the priests to live. So when Mary's pregnant with Jesus and she runs to go live with um, Zechariah and Elizabeth. That's the area where she went to go stay. Um, now traveling down to the water gate, the water gate is named that appropriately because there's two underwater streams that kind of forged together and they tunneled it out and it was the main area where the city could get water. Interesting also, it's the area where David uh, built his palace. Um, so down in that one area, which means that the baths are near him, which is why he was able to spy on Bathsheba, because that's where you go to bathe in the city. Um, the next gate, the fountain gate, has a pool on the outside that's fed out from those streams, and it's where the king's gardens are. Um, so also near where David built his palace. Um, then we have the dung gate. Do I need to explain what this gate's about? <laughs> okay. Um, this gate, uh, sadly, was put in by King Manasseh. He's that brutally mean king in the time of um, Isaiah for like 50 years. And he uh, 
he put that gate in so that he could perform child sacrifices outside the gate. Um, so when they're rebuilding all of this in Nehemiah's time, Nehemiah sends a choir over to that gate to rededicate it for a greater purpose. And so the dung gate uh, gets later used as the gate to go out to the garbage dump. So um, Jesus, when he talks about hell, he uses the word Gehenna. Um, and that's actually the name of the garbage dump outside of uh, Jerusalem. And it was known as the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth because there was wild dogs and critters living in the dump. And it was known as the place where the fire never went out because um, there were always burning garbage out there. So it was because Jesus always grabbed at what was there to use as an illustration to teach us great things. Um, and so that was one of the things he grabbed at. Um, the valley gate just opens up to the valley, and it's where Nehemiah goes out to do his inspection at the beginning when he's checking the gate out. Um, the old gate um, is old. Uh, <laughs> Jerusalem is an old city just in general, and it's gone through many stages. So um, if we look all the way back into Genesis to the time of Abraham, uh, Abraham has this king named King Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem, who comes out and blesses him. Um, and he is the king of this city. He is the king of Salem. And then later, we go hundreds of years later, David overtakes the city of Salem, and he names it Jerusalem. And um, so the old gate, we don't know how old it is, if it's as old as the time of King Melchizedek. Um, but um, what's interesting is the word Salem is hope in um, Hebrew, and Jeru means new. So King Melchizedek was the king of the city of hope, and he's this beautiful picture of Christ in the book of Hebrews. Um, so it's very exciting, and then David names the city New Hope, which is also the name of the fourth episode of Star Wars, yes. Okay, just throwing that out there. Okay, the fish gate was used for uh, where the fish um, were brought through that they caught in the Mediterranean Sea and the Sea of Galilee, and they came through there. And that brings us back around to the sheep gate. So in um, Nehemiah's um, telling, he starts us at the sheep gate, and he ends us at the sheep gate. And so, you know, today we are going to camp on something that happened at the sheep gate. That's what we're going to be looking at today. So... <laughs> Um, if you have Bibles, we're going to be jumping into John chapter 5. So this is 450 years into the future for Nehemiah. So Jesus and Nehemiah are separated by about 450 years. And so I will begin reading verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there in Jerusalem, near the sheep's gate, was a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. I'm going to pause there for just one second. Um, so I'm reading from an NIV, and it doesn't explain this, but your Bibles might explain this. <laughs> um, but this pool was understood to be a pool of healing, and that on certain occasions, an angel would come down and stir the pool, and whoever was the first into the pool was, um, was healed. So it was like this race to try and be the first one into the pool, okay? Um, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in his condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, and he picked up his mat. So cool. And we kind of end our story there. But did, did you realize the story keeps going? Like there's more to this story. So let's keep reading a little more. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, 
It's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him again, who is this fellow who told you to pick, up your, pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Okay. We're going to make a couple observations here. One, it's the Sabbath. Kind of an interesting detail, if you think about it. So it's the Sabbath, and everyone's hanging out around this pool, waiting for God to heal somebody. And yet, when Jesus shows up and heals people, like the guy with the crippled hand, and everybody gets mad, you know, because he healed on the Sabbath. It was the Sabbath. <laughs> so kind of a, a double standard there. Um, but also what's interesting is, being that it's the Sabbath, Jesus told the guy to pick up his mat. Okay, so Jesus knows if I tell this guy to pick up his mat, he's going to get in trouble. He's not supposed to be doing that. He could have just healed the guy. He's not like he's going to keep the mat. Come on, if that was your mat and you suddenly could walk, you would burn that mat. You'd be perfectly fine walking away from it. You don't need to grab it. So Jesus decides to tell him, pick up your mat. And then when the guy gets in trouble, Jesus takes off. He set the guy up. What is that about? They don't teach you that in Sunday school. That's just mean. You know, Jesus is around the corner, and John are like, oh, look, he's so in trouble. High five. You know, and they're having a great time watching this guy get yelled at, you know, and he's alone. Maybe God's healed you and it landed you into some trouble, and then you kind of felt alone. Maybe that's a story you can identify with. Well, that is just rude behavior on Jesus' part, and I think it begs some attention, right? So why did Jesus set this guy up for a big conflict and then jet out and leave the guy alone? Let's explore that. Well... Let's read. Let's read on a little bit more. Picking up in verse 14, it says, Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Okay. Observation. The guy goes to the temple. Why? Why does he go to the temple? Does he go to the temple to worship? To thank God for helping him walk? That he is now healed? Why does he go to the temple? I don't think he went to worship. And I don't think he went to worship because of Jesus' response to him. Jesus his comment, his, his comment um, is not in inviting the guy to come to worship with him. Jesus shows up and he warns him. He warns this guy, stop sinning. Or something may happen to you. Not something will happen to you. It's not a threat. Jesus isn't threatening the guy, but something may happen to you. Maybe the man didn't need forgiving. Maybe the man needed to forgive. Maybe there was something in his heart that Jesus saw. So let's look at what we know about this guy. We know that he was crippled for 38 years. I'm 38 years old. Could you imagine having been crippled since the late 70s? And that's your life. Um, not being able to move, not having assistance. Um, when asked if he wants to be well, he doesn't say yes. That's interesting. And when asked if he wants to be well, he instead blames other people for his situation, why he can't get well. He doesn't blame people for why he's, uh, why he's broken, but he, he claims them for why he's remained in his state. It's everyone else's fault. 
Which makes me wonder, what does he want more? To be well or to shame those people who don't help him into the water? What does he want more? When Jesus asked the question, it kind of showed what he wanted more of. He didn't want to be well. He wanted to be right. He wanted to be angry. Sometimes you like being angry, don't you? I mean, come on. Come on. Sometimes we like being angry. And this, this guy had a right to be angry. He had a right to be angry. It was totally valid. And I know I'm making this really grand assumption that this guy is angry and he's bitter and that's why he's at the temple. But think about it. If there was some dude in Kalama who was paralyzed and it's been 38 years and no one's helped him into the pool, one of us would do something about it. Someone here would have enough compassion. We call each other, rally, make sure that that guy gets in the pool that day. We would do that in Kalama, right? So how come no one has helped this guy? You got to ask that question. That's weird. Unless he started becoming someone that you're like, well, good riddance. He deserves it. The most compassionate person in Jerusalem was like, let him lie there. He's probably become bitter. He's that salty, bitter neighbor down the street with no visitors, and everyone's like, well, good riddance. He deserves that. He's probably become that. Remember, Jesus said, you are well again. It means that he wasn't always not well. Okay? So he's evolved into that. So um, I, I do think that the man has anger and some brokenness that needs to be dealt with. Um, so what does he want to do at the temple that day? What did Jesus stop him from doing? Was he bitter and planning to shame everyone? Did he have a speech prepared? Do you? I do. There are people <laughs> that have, you know, made me angry, have hurt me, and I've got a speech prepared. My mom hears it all the time. I come over really mad. Ah, there's my speech. I don't actually say it to their face. I'm too angry to say it to them, you know. But we have a speech prepared probably had a speech. You guys, you passed by me and you never helped me. You see me now? Um, and maybe if he had something worse planned. I hope not. But it makes me think of, um, and this is just, I work in a school. It makes me think of school shootings, like that kid that was invisible and passed up and no one helped them, and their brokenness was very obvious to them, and everyone passed them up, and so they showed up to school one day ready for business. Or they show up to a movie theater, or they show up to a mall. You know, we know this, though. Jesus intercepted. He intercepted whatever was about to happen at the temple that day. And the man had a right to be angry. But you don't got to sin in your anger. <laughs> Wasn't that eloquent? I said that so eloquently. Yes. Nailed it. Okay. So the thing we have to look at is that he goes to the temple, not to the marketplace. Now, it's the Sabbath day, so no one's going to be shopping on the Sabbath because we all know shopping's not relaxing and fun, right? No, it's just work, so we can't do that on the Sabbath. So no one's in the marketplace, but honestly, this guy has waited 38 years to be mad. He can wait one more day to yell at everybody in the marketplace, but he doesn't. He goes to the temple because he's intentionally there because that's where the people are he's mad at, the people who passed him up, the people who would yell at him for picking up his mat. That's where those people are. He shows up where... The religious, prominent folk are who are supposed to be compassionate. It was completely intentional that he was there. So I think that Jesus set the guy up, told him to pick his mat up, let him get yelled at, and was completely alone in it. That whole setup by Jesus, and he jets out was just to get this guy to his breaking point so that he shows up at the temple ready for business. I think that that's what that was about. I am not saying that God sets people up to go in and do terrifying things to places 
or sets everybody up to go and blow up and yell at people. But I think that this man was not ready to have a heart-to-heart conversation with Jesus. He wasn't there yet. And it would take people judging him for picking his mat up and then feeling alone all of a sudden to get him there. Because he's, he's not responding to Jesus. I think that Jesus set him up, and then Jesus showed up. And that is what Jesus wanted to heal him of. That's the healing in this story. The real healing is in this story is this man's brokenness. Not that he could walk. The real healing is not in verses 8 and 9. It's in verses 14 and 15. So let's ask a question. Why couldn't Jesus have just dealt with the guy's bitterness at the pool? Well, one, you know, we've looked at it. He makes an excuse back. He's not ready to have the conversation. God has to kind of help him get there. But also, if Jesus had not left when he had told the guy to get up and walk, that argument would have been aimed at Jesus, not at that guy. And that guy could continually feel empowered in his anger, and it would have become more public. You know what I'm saying? I think that God was giving this man a little bit of um, just more respect by letting it be more of a private matter, in a way, by walking up to him at the temple and warning him. And this guy needed the paral- his, um, his paralyzed condition to be just dealt with because it was an obstacle for him to really be healed. And maybe that's part of where we can find that in our own condition. There's something that we are hung up on, and we think that that's the thing we need, to be, we need healing of. That's like this small thing compared to what Jesus has business with us on, right? So he took care of that so that he could have real business with him. And sometimes Jesus' healing process in our life is some really grand design. And it may even mean that sometimes we feel alone a little bit. It's all part of how he's drawing us closer to him. So, the sheep's gate. Okay, so this guy had to pass through the sheep's gate to get from the pool. Um, And what was the sheep's gate purpose? It wasn't just to bring flocks through. They didn't just bring any sheep through, like, oh, we've got to bring sheep through for market. The reason why the priests oversaw that gate was because the sheep that passed through that gate were those that were going to be sacrificed. It was a gate that sacrifices passed through. And this man had to pass through a gate of sacrifice to come to the temple that day. What did he have to sacrifice? A broken spirit, a dry heart. There's something that needs to be sacrificed. So if you want to open and look at Romans chapter 12, I'm going to start reading at verse 1 and then speak, and then we're going to jump to the end of that chapter. But um, it's really interesting sometimes when you start praying over scripture and different things and You know, the more it's like, oh, gosh, that that just makes me think of living sacrifice. That makes me think of Romans chapter 12. And God was bringing me to Romans chapter 12 for other reasons. And so it's um, kind of fun, I think, sometimes having that time and watching God do his thing. So um, here we go. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We're that sacrifice. We are called to be sheep who pass through that gate and lay things down for the sake of God's mercy. And I I, I love... Paul's 1 Corinthians chapter 13 love chapter, but my favorite love chapter is 
the Romans 12 love chapter, and I'd read all of it, but um, I'm going to just jump to the end of it. Because this is the thing about being a sacrifice. A sacrifice is always on someone's behalf. Whose behalf, we might say, um, or question. Um, So in verse 17, Paul picks up in Romans 12. He says, do not, oh, and I want you to think of it this way, okay? We have this tender moment. Jesus slips up next to the guy at the temple and is like, hey, watch yourself. Don't sin. You're well now. Um, but I want you to think of this as, as Jesus and this guy, like, went out and sat and had a cup of coffee on the steps. So I want you to hear these words Paul wrote down as Jesus talking to this guy. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friend, But leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I think think Jesus said something like that to this guy. I absolutely do. And, and the funny thing is, we, we and what, maybe the word enemy feels a little strong to you right now. Like, I would say all the people who makes me mad and I have a speech for, they're not my enemies, you know? Um, but still, still, you know, you need to deal with forgiving people. Um, maybe you have a nemesis, perhaps, could be you know, um, and you need to forgive your nemesis, um, and, and maybe the person that you are in need of forgiving, um, you know, is has passed on. Like, what do you do then? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that, but um, when it says um, <laughs> that uh, in doing all of this, it's like keeping burning coals on their head. And I know so many people who are like, yeah, that's like sweet revenge, you know? Like, keep burning coals on their head. Kill them with kindness, you know? And I'm, it, that's not what this is talking about. It's not about being so sweet that they feel disarmed. Now, yes, Jesus actually launches into that um, when he tells you, when your enemy tells you, you know, give me your... Um, or carry my bag for a mile, you carry it too, right? You disarm them. But this isn't telling us that. What this is talking to us about, you're going to like this as much as I do. I hate this, but it's true. So um, think of when Isaiah is getting called in Isaiah chapter 6, and he's like, whoa, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. And an angel comes down with tongs and grabs a coal from the sacrificial altar and touches his mouth, and he purifies Isaiah. He purifies Isaiah's mouth. And so when you are called to love your enemy and it's like heaping burning coals on them, you're purifying your enemy. You are taking the tongs and grabbing the coal off the sacrificial altar and purifying your enemy so that God's mercy comes over the person that's wronged you. That's why Paul starts his chapter out, be a living sacrifice in view of God's mercy. Now, it's okay to have angry moments like, I don't want God's mercy on my enemies. That's why I like the book of Psalms, you know, because the book of Psalms is like justice, you know. Um, so wherever you're feeling, you're going to find it in the Bible, right? The moment to help you. But, but the hope is that we get there. The hope is that we get there to where we want God's mercy on our enemies and we want purification for them. We don't want to see them get burned by those coals that we've thrown on them, you know. All right. I think I'm a little too transparent sometimes. <laughs> um, so if we go back, back to this guy, right, you know, did he ever come around? Well, verse 15 gives us this. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. Did you see the end where he's well? 
Jesus asked him, do you want to be well? The guy's able to walk. Jesus calls him well, and now this guy lives it. He's, he's now claiming being well. And being well is what? Going to his enemies and telling them about Jesus. And if he does that, maybe they'll become pure too. Maybe they will know him. Maybe they will be overcome by how great God is. He went to them. He was made well. So how do you forgive someone who's brutally wronged you? Well, I am not an authority on the subject, sorry, uh, just to be perfectly honest. <laughs> um, but I do believe that maybe the first step in that would be when Jesus asks you if you want to be well, say yes. Maybe you're not really ready to say yes. Maybe the honest answer to Jesus right now is, I'm too angry, and I like being angry, Lord. Please help me to not like this. Please help me to not identify myself in this way. If I forgive them, I may not know myself. It's become too much of who I am now. So, Lord, help me to be okay with this. Help me to say yes to you. Help me to want to be well. Um, I have a prayer journal, and um, when I and I write in it often. And when I write in it, when I'm angry about something, like dude, I just let God have it. I'm so done with this, and you know, and I'm writing to Him. And so my speech is written down. You know, I write my speech out into my prayer journal. But I always go back and I read over my prayer journal. And when I go back and I read over it, and like I'm hearing my words back to me, God's spirit is so heavy upon me where he starts pointing out everything I need to take ownership in. It's that part in Romans 12 where he says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And I'm not doing that. As far as it depends on me, yes, there are things I can definitely take ownership in when I'm now reading my prayer journal and what I had to say to that person. And God convicts me over my part. And then he moves me from wanting to write or, I mean, pray about them to where I can pray for them. There's a difference there. There's a huge difference in praying about a person than praying for a person. And God moves me there. And so maybe part of it is just um, perhaps as we read over Romans 12 and this love chapter and how Paul is building us up to be ready for this crazy declaration that we need to love our enemies. And, and what's that story? I mean, if the person has already passed away or passed on, so you can't go to them to, in some way, make it right. God still has a way of your heart being brought to him and making that right. Um, and I don't know how God is going to call you to act later in regards to the person. And maybe he won't call you to act in regards to that person because um, that person is so far back in some other part of your life. But maybe he will. Maybe you are to, you know, call them. I don't know. It's going to be different for each of us, right? He's going to get us there. He's going to get us ready for that. Um, so maybe start there. Write down your speech, not to give to them, but to give it to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we just, we love you. Um, we thank you for being the God that knows our heart. You know what's behind our response when you ask us questions. Lord, so many of your questions we try and skirt and get out of the way of, and we don't want to face up to, but Lord, you're always preparing us and setting us up to, to really deal with what we're broken because you want to heal. You want your rain to pour down on dry hearts. You, you want 
to make things right in us. Lord, may we be brave. May we be brave enough to do that. May we be humble enough for that. Father, we give you this week and what you have in store, Lord. We are game. We are game for it. Pass over us and pass through us. In your name, amen.